Hey, Retrospectors, I have a fantastic podcast recommendation for you, and that is Pretty Much Pop. It's a culture podcast. They talk about telly, movies, music, games, podcasts, novels, comedy, theatre, and they explore why and how we consume these things. How does pop culture even work in a world that is so fragmented? Where is the line between trash and treasure? Pretty Much Pop brings together philosophers, artists, comedians and other smart folks to attempt to answer these questions. Most of what people like is pretty weird when you think about it. So thinking about it is what Pretty Much Pop does. You can find Pretty Much Pop, a culture podcast, wherever you're listening to this or at prettymuchpop.com. It's October 9th, 1934, and another remarkable event is about to be uncovered by Aria. Rebecca and Ali, the Retrospectors. King Alexander of Yugoslavia had a policy of making no public appearances on Tuesdays, which he considered unlucky because three family members had been assassinated on Tuesdays. But when he arrived in Marseille for a state visit to France today in history in 1934, on a Tuesday, he had no choice but to proceed through the city in a welcome motorcade. All seemed to be going well at first. A man even leapt onto the running board of the car with a bouquet of flowers crying, Vive le roi! Unfortunately, that bouquet of flowers concealed a Mauser pistol. Yes, a semi-automatic pistol concealed in a bouquet of flowers. But he was saying, long live the king. So that is presumably why he wasn't perceived as a threat to the king, despite the armed guards all around. Because people did know that there was a risk that Alexander might be assassinated. So Yugoslavia at this point is a country that is, it's been cobbled together at the end of World War I from the old Austro-Hungarian Empire and the Ottoman Empire And in it, there are Slovenians, Serbs, Croats, Slavs, Montenegrins, Macedonians, Catholics, Muslims, Jews. I mean, it's a mess. And a lot of these countries want their independence and have been sort of forced together through the Treaty of Versailles. And the king is Serbian and the capital is Belgrade in Serbia, which has gone down very badly with all of those other groups, particularly the Croats. So he's on this diplomatic visit to France, but it was clear there was a risk. But the assassin, Vlado Chernozemsky, is immediately struck down by a mounted policeman's sword and the furious crowd then savagely just stomps and beat him to death in this vengeful frenzy. And I suppose what's really remarkable about this whole event is that it was captured on camera. It's the first ever assassination in modern times that was captured in this way. It was filmed by a newsreel cameraman who is standing just a few feet away, which means that you have this really close-up view that you can still see today if you go to YouTube of the king dying and this crazed aftermath. The the sort of the moment of death and the, the sort of few seconds afterwards do seem to be a little bit skipped. I don't know exactly what happened, but I could imagine that there was a certain amount of chaos around the cameraman at the time. I don't know. I mean, to miss the moment of impact, that really is 101 when you're filming an assassination. <laughs> right, exactly. But what is incredible is that he, the, the camera stays close to the dying king and you get this really sort of almost a, a kind of grim precursor to the President John F. Kennedy assassination. You have this really sort of similar visceral experience as a viewer of going through the exact same situation. Yeah, Chernozemsky, he was set upon by a mob, but also that's fairly understandable because as he tried to sort of fire his way out of the situation. He killed two more civilians. The weird thing is that he is still considered a national hero in Bulgaria. Uh, Streets are named after him there. Um, The rest of Europe, however, was horrified, partly because of those shocking newsreels and the close-ups of the mortally wounded Alexander. Um, Chernozemsky was an assassin for the International Macedonian Revolutionary Organization, which was a nationalist group that advocated for an independent Macedonia led by its ethnic Bulgarian majority. And he'd actually already carried out two hits on former members who tried to leave the organization but he'd been hired by a croat group called the utasha like an extreme nationalist group and you can see you know they all hate alexander so much they're sort of buying hitmen from other ethnic groups within the region they hired him to train their own assassins to kill alexander he brought three of them to france but ultimately in what i can imagine was a comedy montage of them like missing shots at bottles on a wall decided that he was going to do it himself yeah, and this was being done with permission and the tacit approval of 
nations, Italy and Hungary specifically. I mean, you could call this state-sponsored terrorism, which would be applying a modern term to what happened in 1934. But basically, Italy and Hungary are secretly funding, arming, aiding and abetting these radicals and assisting them and training them because of their own ambitions in the Balkans. They want to redraw the map after the Treaty of Versailles too. They want more power. And France is kind of aware of these things when it invites King Alexander over on this diplomatic mission. And it's delicate, because although they're aware of Mussolini's ambitions, they're also keen to keep Belgrade as an ally with Italy, Mm. because they're more concerned about Hitler. And that's the case for Britain as well. Everyone in Europe is aware that Hitler's a bad guy, And there's still this feeling of like, well, maybe we can get Mussolini on side, extraordinarily. (laughs) Maybe this is a fascist we can work with. (laughs) And so when the king then gets shot, even though it becomes evident pretty quickly that Italy was involved behind the scenes, France doesn't want to publicly admit that. Yeah, and meanwhile, Alexander's body was transported back to Yugoslavia on the destroyer that he came on, the Dubrovnik. And after lying in state in Belgrade, his remains were then conveyed to the St. George's Church in Oplanach for a burial. And among those paying their respects were uh, Marshal Philippe Pertin from France and Luftwaffe General Hermann Goering. You may have heard of him from the Third Reich. <laughs> and Hitler also sent a large wreath, which I thought was very nice of him <laughs> you know again much maligned that Hitler guy but yeah. it turns out he's, he's commonly found doing really lovely things <laughs> and I think one thing that's like really sad about all of this is that Alexander started out as being quite popular you know in Serbia he was one of the top commanders in the first Balkan War of 1912 to 1913 where the Balkan League swept the Ottomans almost completely out of Europe uh, he became regent for his father in 1914 and then again was leading Serbia during World War One. it was really brutal because Serbia did not have the resources for mass conscription. So their recruits in World War One often just wore their own clothes and brought their own weapons from home. So it was a real sort of ragtag army. And he was seen as being a bit of a hero. He helped lead this massive retreat through the mountains when Austria invaded Belgrade. Loads of soldiers and refugees died of exposure or disease. Eventually, the surviving Serbians were evacuated to Corfu by the Allies, and there they started to regroup. And this was where everything started to go a bit wrong. Um, the leaders of the Serbs, Croats and Slovenians, signed an agreement to form a new nation after the war which would unite those groups as Yugoslavia and Alexander was actually pretty lukewarm on this idea but he saw that was the way the wind was blowing and ultimately he emerged from the victors negotiations in 1918 as prince regent of the new Yugoslavia and then became king when his father died in 1921 and so there was like this this real idea that this was going to be great for the Balkan region to bring those nations and ethnicities together and make them stronger but Alexander who was their king he himself was skeptical that this would work And it turns out he was right to be sceptical. Well, and also you say that he was popular, but over the time that he was in charge... (laughs) You say that he was popular, but I put to you his assassination (laughs) in today in history. By by multiple contenders. (laughs) (laughs) But, you know, but uh, but even prior to that, he'd started to tighten his grip. He'd assumed in 1931 unrestricted executive powers under a new constitution that he pushed through and elections, which prior to uh, this had had uh, universal suffrage, admittedly uh, male only, now had the secret ballot completely abolished and all public employees were required to vote for the king's party. And on top of this, the king appointed members of the parliament's upper house, giving him basically de facto control over all legislation. So I think, that, you know, that kind of undermined this king of the people perception that may have come with the early days of his rule. Meantime, what we're left with, as you alluded to earlier, is this newsreel footage. I mean, it's sort of the reason that anyone remembers, certainly in Britain and America, that anyone remembers who King Alexander was at all, is because this was sensational news footage that the world was very excited to see. And it's interesting, you can see both versions on YouTube, the British Pathé version and the 20th Century Fox version. I'm pleased to say the British version is not grubby. Uh, (laughs) It's well narrated (laughs) and it fesses up to the fact that they don't have the shot where he gets shot. But the American version added the sound of gunshots to the newsreel in an astounding (laughs) case of fake news. So American viewers, millions of them in cinemas across the country, heard bang, bang, bang. 
And then literally the, the commentator goes, oh, he's been shot. Like they didn't know what happened. <laughs> and then these <laughs> swelling like, Hans Zimmer strings and exactly. you know, <laughs> slow emotion. motion shots yeah. of King Alexander yeah. clutching his stomach. <laughs> so they specially commissioned orchestrated music for the occasion, but were surprised by the event. Um, <laughs> but anyway, uh, it emerged later that obviously those sounds were added later because the crucial moment wasn't filmed. Uh, mm. And in fact, he was shot 10 times. I mean, if they'd actually had the footage, it would have been even more sensational and dramatic. Uh, but Americans thought he'd been shot three times, and that was sensational enough. They had to wait for the director's cut to see all of those. Like... Tomorrow. Don't understand how you can be dignified about a process that introduces smells into a theatre. <laughs> <laughs> Ditch the ads and get a Sunday episode when you join Club Retrospectors. Patreon.com slash Retrospectors.